I think that consumers are less and less interested in seeing a perfectly polished, glossy view of the world. And, you know, I think that brands are sort of letting people into their story and giving up control and letting people see behind the curtain. This is The Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Emily, thank you so much for joining me on the safari. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, Great to talk to you. Well, it's so fun for me to be able to do this with you. Um, obviously, uh, I'm a huge fan of yours, but you also named one of my babies. So, you know, I think it's it's only appropriate that we should be talking about your incredible new book and about all the things that you do uh, at your wonderful company, Red Antler, which, uh, as I said, named uh, our company Orchard Mile, one of our portfolio companies. And um, so we are big fans of Red Antler and everything that you do. How are you? Where are you? So I'm doing as well as can be, nothing to complain about. I am in Southampton, has been out here for the duration of the pandemic and uh, have settled in pretty nicely. You know, I mean, obviously it's a strange and challenging time, but I definitely feel fortunate. And how about you? Where are you? So I'm back in the city, which I'm happy to say uh, I've been here for a month. I did leave for a little bit, but came back. Uh, I wanted the kids to be, you know, uh, finish off their school here. Anyway, things are well in the city and we're definitely opening up as we record here. We are the the week before uh, the Monday that will open up the city completely, um, phase two. So um, it's it's exciting time. So let's get right into this. You have written a book, which I ordered the minute I heard of it from your email, um, which is called Obsessed. And I love that because I think it's a word that I've heard you use quite often. And that might indeed be the reason why you called it that. Um, because one, it's sort of a merchant view, right? When you, when you hear a name or you have an idea and you're just become obsessed with it and you just want to run with it and you just, that, that kernel of truth uh, whereby the brand just suddenly comes to life is how I interpret that. But maybe I'm wrong. So tell us a little bit about Red Antler. Tell us a little bit about why you did the book. And then I'd love to get into some of the key takeaways. Yeah, definitely. Well, as for the title, I love your interpretation. And part of what I like about the word is I think that there are a lot of different ways to read into it. Certainly, founders need to be obsessed. You know, we as brand builders need to be obsessed with the ideas that we're bringing to life. But really why I chose the title and actually what um, sparked the idea to write the book was about consumers mm -hmm. and thinking mm -hmm. about this new, incredibly passionate relationship that people have with a lot of the newer brands that we're seeing launch across a very wide range of categories. So, you know, over the past 13 years of running and growing Red Antler, um, as you know, we specialize in startups. We help bring new businesses into the world, including Orchard Mile. And what we've seen is that no category is safe. You know, I think we all have these legacy brands that we used to buy because our parents bought them and we don't have to anymore. And category after category, we're seeing these startups come in and create a whole new kind of relationship with people. And that's really what the book is about. It's about how do you do that? How do you put something new into the world that's going to generate that level of obsession from the beginning? So the, your your Red Antler uh, platform has been responsible 
uh, I think most notably, but there are many others I know, um, such as Casper, um, that you you brought into the world. Um, and I think there's a wonderful handwriting that you guys have. And I don't think it's uh, it's fair to say that you do the same thing for everybody. You clearly do not. But there's a handwriting maybe of the 21st century that you employ, I think, whereby you're sort of taking cues from the consumer. It's very approachable. Uh, you almost um, feel like you're part of the brand as a consumer watching what you do. So you know, that passion that you described, the passionate relationship with brands, um, I think is is quite evocative and it, it actually comes through in your work. And so when I think of you guys as a almost like a brand of brands, right? You got Your brand is that you make brands and you make beautiful, wonderful brands. How does that all come together what is it about the consumer that you are listening to that sort of comes across in this thread of everything that you touch so we try to create brands that tap into universal truths without sounding too heady about it you know i think obviously every new business that's launching into the world has an idea of who their target audience is. And ideally, that idea has a focus to it and a clarity to it. But at the same time, I think we want to build brands that evoke a feeling within people and ideally a very wide range of people. So it really does start with the consumer. You know, who is this person? And I don't just mean demographically. I think that's actually less important. It's less about how old are they and where do they live and what do they do for a living? And it's more about what do they believe? What do they need? What's missing from their life? And how can the brands that we build be an answer to that need? Um, and, and really, therefore, ensuring that whatever it is we're bringing into the world has that baked in relevance and is going to immediately connect with people on a deeper level than just what the product is and what it does. Do you think that the passionate relationship that you describe could sometimes be deemed almost a religious relationship with brands, uh, with, with this new generation who are trying to maybe um, put their ethics into their wallet? Ooh, well, I don't want to stir up controversy necessarily, but I do think if we think about what religion is able to achieve, brands now can also achieve a sense of unity among the people who choose them, you know, a feeling of connection, right? Like we're all a fan of this brand together and therefore we feel closer to each other and perhaps a little bit of a fervor. But I think that, you know, you're absolutely right that that fervor needs to come from a place of shared values and feeling like this brand is really tapping into a core belief. Yeah, I think I think religion might be a strong word. I think a spirituality is really maybe more where I'm going. Um, I think Gloria Steinem said something similar, right, which is that you can tell the measure of a person by how they how they spend their money, right? Uh, what are the things they spend their money on? Uh, which I think is is wonderful. So speaking about the 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 the, the plumbing of or the let's say the the crystallization of of what you do because I'm you know I'm a great believer in a name. I'm a great believer in that kernel of truth. You know, distilling that um, that down to that message down from many different things uh, to one or even two. I, I even experienced it with how you tried to deal with um, you know, all of our crazy ideas at Orchard Mile. Um, and I'm sure every entrepreneur shows up on your doorstep saying, we, we solve all the problems of the world in these 12 different ways. So maybe make, t- talk, talk us through the sausage making of how you deal with an entrepreneur and get them to focus. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I would love to also hear from you what that experience was like on the other side. Um, But, you know, I think you've hit the nail on the head that when we meet with a team who has a vision about what they're launching, the issue is never that they don't have enough to say. It's always that they have too much to say. You know, they've been thinking about this business sometimes for years before they've decided to take the plunge and launch it. And they'll tell you, you know, for hours and hours, all the different things it's going to achieve and ultimately how it's going to change the world. And that's exciting. And we feed off of that energy but our job is to really come in and, and pull out what's most important here. Um, you know, of everything that you're saying, what parts of that actually matter? And then how do we take all these different nuggets and threads and ideas and features and visions 
and ladder them up into one idea that this brand can really stand for and own. I mean, for you, you know, when we started talking about Orchard Mile, I feel like this was something that you had been bouncing around in your head for a long time before you came to us. Isn't that, isn't that right? That's correct. Yeah. And I think it was, it was a, um, I think it was an, an interesting thing and I, I, that when you come down to um, trying to communicate in that instance, the digital nature of something um, and what the product can do for someone, it, you can go off into many different directions. And I think that on the one hand is there's the edit, right? But on the other hand, there's also the consistency. You you can't come up with a kernel of truth and then veer away from it. And so what are some of the things that you do to keep people, you know, consistent over time? Because there's one thing to launch with something, but how do you keep on showing them where the, the, the North Star actually is? Well, consistency has gotten even trickier in recent years because it used to be that in order to be consistent, you could literally just have your tagline and repeat it everywhere that you showed up because you didn't have to show up in too many places. So it was actually much easier to stay on message. I think now what we're seeing is, yes, brands still need that consistency and that focus, but they also need to show up in so many different channels. And those channels have different rules. And you don't necessarily want to see the same thing from a brand on Facebook, as you do on Instagram, as you do in Instagram stories, as you do on the brand's owned website, right? So there, it, it's become even more complex to figure out what are the what are the parts of this that need to stay true no matter where we're appearing, and then where can we have that flex, and where can we break our own rules? Um, you know, the way that we think about it is having an incredibly clear idea of the North Star, right? Like, what at its core does this brand stand for? But then how do we build in layers and complexity so we can play with that notion and express it in different ways depending on where we're showing up? The, just coming back to Casper, and I'd love you to touch on a few other companies that you might be able to speak about th- that kernel of truth, that, uh, you know, whether it's Casper and or feel free to name a few others. Yeah. So you know, with Casper, when the founders came to us, Nobody believed that you could sell a mattress through e-commerce. It just hadn't been done. Consumers had been trained that you need to show up to a showroom and under very bright, harsh lights with a pushy salesman hovering over you, you know, try out the different beds to find the one that's comfortable for you. And the idea of making, you know, such an expensive big ticket purchase sight unseen with at the time when Casper launched only one choice. It's not even like they were offering, you know, here's our medium one, here's our firm one. There was just one. Felt almost unfathomable. Um, so what we did was we we took a look at the category and looked at how all these other brands that most people didn't even really know the names of, certainly didn't have relationships with, how were they communicating? And what we found is that everybody was playing in this very functional space where they were talking about their different foams and there were lots of jargon and pseudoscientific descriptions of how the bed works and you know what's in it with little trademark signs next to made up words. And nobody was talking about why you ultimately want to get a great night's sleep, which is that you want to wake up feeling great. You know, great night's sleep ultimately is about what it gives you, which is an amazing day and therefore by extension, a better life. So the core idea for Casper, that North Star, was that better sleep leads to a more interesting life. And all of our creative choices in those early days were really about playing up that duality. And it it, it comes across in somewhat literal ways sometimes. You know, instead of showing people just to sleep in the dark on a Casper, we'd show them reading an interesting quirky book or playing mini golf on their bed and, and really thinking about, you know, who are these people beyond who they are as sleepers? Yeah, they, how do they live? They live in their beds, exactly. Uh, but I think, do you think it's a generational thing? Do you think, do you think that young people at, at inherently, if they have the option to not buy their parents or grandparents' brands, will uh, act that way? Or do you think there's more to it than just a generational shift to new brands for new consumers? So I think a lot of these brands get pegged as, millennial brands. And I actually disagree with that characterization. I think that 
consumers of every age group are now in a position where they have more choice, more power, and more information than ever before. Like the tables have turned. And millennials happen to be the generation that came of age while that shift was occurring. But ultimately, I think that most consumers, if given the choice, want the more transparent option, the more enjoyable option, the more convenient option. You know, why stick with these brands that have sort of taken us for granted for decades, you know, and sort of assumed that because they own the, you know, retail relationship that we kind of had no choice, you know, why stick with them if something better comes along? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a there's a um an interesting part of your life which I love, <clears throat> which is that you, you yes you're in the design uh, business let's say that but you're also very uh, entrepreneurial in the sense that you you don't mess around when you think about taking positions in companies and you have a, a sort of a venture eye indeed I think even maybe a venture platform to invest or or take equity in companies so as an investor therefore not just a branding company. Um, and I'm very biased, so I'll I'll shut up on this subject because I am, after all, very involved with Parsons. I'm on the executive committee there. I, I very much value design. Um, but I know for a fact that many people, um, I think, skimp on, on, on investing behind brand and the equity that comes from brand. And, you know, I once upon a time thought that having – you know, Steve Jobs explained what design would mean to the whole business community that you'd have the most valuable company on earth because he did not skimp on design. In fact, he made it sort of the holy grail about how things looked and felt and what was the why behind it all. Um, to, what's your perspective on why people should invest in brand? Well, first of all, I'm just so happy to hear you use the verb invest in brand because I do think we meet a lot of founders who purely see it as a cost. And they think of it in the same bucket that they think of their monthly marketing budget. Like it's just money out the door. And our feeling is if you haven't invested in brand, you shouldn't spend a dime on marketing because you know, you're out there fishing with a net with holes, right? You haven't figured out that core story, that core value equation what's the point of driving people to your website? You know, they're not going to convert. Um, so I think that, you know, it's the initial and ongoing investment that makes all of your other efforts more effective. And, you know, I think this is something that certain industries have understood for a very long time. I mean, you obviously work with fashion brands, right? And I, I would imagine you don't have to convince them of the power of design. Is that true? Um, I think, I think in fact, it's, it's the reverse sometimes with fashion brands and, you know, we, we work with all kinds of consumer companies, but we definitely got our start years ago with, in the fashion space. And I think they may overcompensate actually uh, in design. They, they sometimes think about branding and brand, uh, to the exclusion of everything. And, um, you know, the word brand equity I think is so interesting because equity, if you break it down, it's about balance and, you know, you can go you know too far and I think you can also not go far enough and you have to try and balance that equation whereby, you know, if the left and the right brain has disequilibrium, then your equity's off. And so I, I in fact, I, I've heard you speak before about, um, I think it's an analogy, maybe you'll give it to us around the, the jar of marbles, which I think you you also found somewhere else. But t- tell us about the jar of marbles. Yeah, actually, that came from one of the founders of Casper. Um, Luke Sherwin is his name. And I, I love this analogy. I think about it all the time. And what he said is that your brand equity, and what he meant by that is the, the love, really, that you build with consumers, the goodwill that you create, you know, just from delivering an incredible brand and an incredible experience is like a jar of marbles that you fill. And every time you want to do something that's more salesy, that's more transactional, every time you want to run that, you know, 10% off deal or whatever else it might be, you're removing a marble from that jar. And that's fine. You obviously need to do that, but you have to make sure that you keep refilling it too. So I think it's an, it's an interesting way to think about it that, you know, these relationships 
to go both ways, right? And, you know, with the way I think about brand communications is you always need to be creating more value than you're asking for. You know, if you're going to take someone's time, even by sending an email, there better be something in that email that's delightful, that brings them joy, that makes them smile, that makes them think, or you're just asking without giving anything in return. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage, and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. So talking about giving something in return, uh, humility um, is not something historically you would associate with brands who work very much about pushing their ideas onto people. And um, humility today um, is so important to be human. Uh, and you have to be able to make fun of yourself. You have to be able to maybe show behind the curtain um, and also you know, take some action uh, in, in the world. You can't just be passive or about the things happening around us. I've, I've actually referenced this many times on this podcast whereby um, the, uh, the, the CEO of Gucci was asked, actually at a Traub lecture at Parsons, he was asked about, you know, why should businesses be giving money to a million dollars against gun violence to, and supporting the children who are marching during the horrible tragedies last year. And he said, well, who else is going to do it, right? If the governments don't wake up, don't actually address these things, you know, maybe companies have to do it. And I think Gucci is a wonderful example of an incumbent brand that's really acted like uh, a startup in some ways in, in, in that regard. So when, when, when you're telling your, or advising your, your clients around how to take action, but also be humble and be human, I mean, it's all well and good to talk about these things, but maybe a few examples around where you've seen brands, either your brands or others, um, who've done this gracefully. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, consumers rightfully are demanding more from the companies that they want to give their dollars to, right? And you're absolutely right. I think people recognize that companies are in a position to probably have more impact than certainly the current government, but maybe any government. Um, but I do think that on the flip side, you can't be out there claiming success in an area that truthfully is an incredibly complicated and ongoing journey to solve. So that's where humility comes in. And one area where I've seen it play out well is in the realm of sustainability. You know, I think there are a lot of companies, Allbirds is, is a brand that we helped launch, for example, whose mission is very much rooted in sustainability, but they never came out and said, we've got this all figured out. You know, we're the most environmental shoe you'll ever buy, right? That would be foolish and false because companies can always be better. And there's always parts of the supply chain that can be improved upon. And from the beginning, they were very careful to admit that this was an incredibly important part of who they were and why they were launching this business, but that it would also take time and that they were going to be continually striving to be better. And I think we're now seeing that happen, ideally, in companies' responses to you know the recent protests and the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, There are a lot of companies who, I'd say, long overdue are waking up to how they can contribute to fighting racial injustice. But I think the ones who come out at the gate and try to claim they've got this all figured out and they've got the solution, you know, people recognize that that's impossible and resent when your words are louder than your actions. Yeah. You know, amen to that. Tell me about um, the influencer world that we're living in. So I obviously, and for those who don't know, um, my wife works for YouTube and she has been there for a decade. And I've obviously had a relatively um, front row seat to how important YouTube is in the in, in the ecosystem. I mean, I think they actually just released their numbers recently uh, around their revenue, which they'd never broken out until until now, whereby they are, you know, 
the whole of YouTube's revenue is equivalent to a, a large chunk of the whole television industry in this country. I think it was 30% potentially. Um, but I think what's interesting about YouTube is that those brands, those, 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 make, those creators, as they call them, um, are their own influencer. They are talking about, you know, culturally relevant marketing uh, elements. They are part of the zeitgeist that's happening in the world. Forget just YouTube. And then their brands grow as a result of that. I've always felt that traditional brands or even digital native brands could learn from um, what happens on YouTube, the way they are uniquely uh, on the pulse of what's happening and continually uh, speaking to their followers uh, in a voice that is consistent, but nonetheless very du jour. Um, so the question, therefore, is how do you think brands can effectively be their own influencer, uh, be um, creative in that way, have a videographer on staff, uh, you know, create YouTube channels? Uh, how do you play with all these new tools available to you as a brand, in your opinion? Well, I think that you're absolutely right that building those capabilities in-house is incredibly important. And, you know, I'm saying that as someone who obviously runs a branding company that businesses hire to help them. And I think that we play an important role too. But ultimately, you know, what you've tapped into with what these YouTube creators do so well is there's a fluidity and a porousness to their work. You know, they're taking in inputs and then they're putting something else out as a result of those inputs. And it always feels fresh and relevant and like a constant two-way conversation between them and their audience. And I think that's something that brands need to be thinking about daily. It needs to be built into their culture. You know, especially when you think about, you know, sort of how social media works and the incredible opportunity that it presents to be just out there every single day you know, reflecting and shaping what's happening around you. I think that would be a very hard thing ultimately to have someone else run for you because to use everybody's favorite buzzword, you know, authenticity is everything yeah. when it comes to creating those that influential content. Yeah, absolutely. So as we sit in, in COVID, I think I have to ask at least one question around the pandemic. We have um, been he hearing from everybody that the pandemic has accelerated everything in our lives. Uh, everything from technology to how we interact with stores is all going to happen immediately. Uh, do you feel that that is a true? And if indeed it is true, how does that apply to branding and your world? So I think we've certainly seen businesses that were behind the ball on offering, you know, sort of digital solutions that have now very quickly caught up, right? Think of a local shop that sort of spun up e-commerce overnight because they had to. And that's great. And I would imagine that will continue. What I've noticed, and I'm curious how this will play out, is actually the opposite trend, which is that for the first time in a very long time, consumers have patience again. Mm. And that we're willing to wait for things to arrive that we want. And we're not expecting that like the second we click the button on our phone, something appears, you know, within instance, right? So I am curious if that patience will remain or if people will be more willing to accept sort of different modes of commerce for good reason. You know, for example, if a business were to offer you a slower shipping option that's more sustainable, Maybe coming out of this, we'll realize like, hey, it was okay that I waited two weeks for that puzzle to arrive in the mail yeah. or whatever it was I ordered. <laughs> yeah, no, but I agree. I mean, look, I, I must say I had an experience uh, in the last few weeks where I would ordered, I think, a, some kind of fancy keyboard for my iPad. And, you know, it, it didn't show up and I forgot about it, right? And then suddenly it arrived two weeks later I was so excited to get that item that it felt like getting a package when I was, you know, a kid again, right? It was like, okay, I, I can actually get excited by getting a package in the mail, right? Totally. I've had that too, because I'll be in like a quarantine stupor, you know, shopping on my phone at night. And then I'll forget 
what I bought and it doesn't show up for a long time. And when it comes, it's like someone bought me a present, even though it was <laughs> me who bought it. <laughs> oh my God. It was awful. Um, that's, that's wonderful. So, um, just to, as we sort of come to, I mean, I know that, um, as I said to you before we started, that I could probably speak to you for hours on these things. So, but just to try and keep it tight, uh, and as we start to get towards the end, um, could you um, tell me a little bit about the few trends that are interesting to you that you know you're noticing uh, that are uh, that are noteworthy that uh, maybe not necessarily related to the pandemic or what we're living through right now, but um, you know what are the what are the things sort of percolating in your mind that are interesting to to note? So one trend that I think about a lot, and we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, is what does consistency mean today? You know, I think that we're seeing brands who are being forced to experiment with how they show up and how they communicate. And it's sort of part of what it means to be a modern brand is having that flexibility and almost that messiness. And I'm really curious you know, sort of how far that will go. I think that consumers are less and less interested in seeing a perfectly polished, glossy view of the world. And, you know, I think that brands are sort of letting people into their story and giving up control and letting people see behind the curtain. You know, I think you used that phrase earlier. Um, And I just, I wonder how far that will go. You know, I wonder if we'll get to a place where, we're no longer investing in highly produced photo shoots because our aesthetic expectations have shifted so drastically based on the fact that, you know, everyone now is a photographer and a model and a producer. (laughs) And a blogger and a vlogger. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, So, so I try and end this with, um, you know, the latest uh, notes of optimism um, that uh, we're seeing, and I'll, I'll end up giving you the last word. So think about some of the things that you're hopeful for that you're, that that, that are uh, notes of optimism uh, at the end of this. But I, I'm feeling as we sit today that there are many incredibly encouraging signs coming out of Europe. There are even greater signs, even though, uh, Beijing went back into a lockdown yesterday. Uh, I'm hearing incredible things coming out of China uh, as to what the consumer is doing and how they're behaving. And yes, there's a been a glut, so they're all going to race to the stores. But there is a a passion for shopping. There's a passion for their brands. The Europeans are in the streets, in the restaurants, and um, I, I know that we're still, um, at least in the Northeast maybe parts of California and other states are still mostly in lockdown. But I feel very optimistic about about what will come over the coming weeks and months um, for our brands and for all of our businesses. How do you feel? It doesn't have to be related to any of this. What are some notes of optimism from Emily and uh, Red Antler? I think that what we've seen in the past few weeks of people expecting and demanding real accountability from businesses as it comes to their own internal hiring practices and who they're depicting in their ads and, you know, being part of the solution and not part of the problem to me is incredibly encouraging. You know, I think that businesses have an unbelievable degree of power to shift, not just culture, but ultimately, you know, outcomes for real people and what their lives look like. And I love seeing this new wave of activism and accountability um, that, you know, we're seeing sort of across every category. You know, I saw in my email today that, you know, Chase is is closing its branches early for Juneteenth. Like, let's have businesses make that into a national holiday. Um, So for me, that's that's incredibly optimistic. And I'm hoping that we're finally going to start turning a tide that should have turned a long, long, long time ago. Amen to that. And so um, I'm obsessed with you. We're all obsessed with your book, Named Obsessed. Um, I cannot urge everyone enough to go out and buy this book. Uh, It's Emily Haywood's book, Obsessed, Building a Brand, 
people love from day one. And the reason why you should buy this book is because Emily and her colleagues have a way of being, I would say, a cultural barometer as to how to build brands in the age that we live in. And um, I just really enjoyed having you on the safari, Emily. So Emily Hayward, thank you for doing the safari with me. Thank you so much. This is a blast. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.